Now, despite record-breaking inequality and poverty in this country uh, that I was talking about earlier in the show, you wouldn't know it exists when you look at the free flow of cash and glitz pouring into politics. Take a look at the donors going to a fundraiser for President Obama in L.A. last night. Now, despite the tough economy, supporters still shelled out for recent Obama events from Seattle to San Diego over two days, upwards of $5 million. Supporters paying up to the legal limit of close to 36 grand to hear Obama speak or have dinner or whatever. Now, it's a sum that many Americans right at that fundraiser could never envision affording. Take a listen to a protester outside. You see that restaurant? He's charging $35,000 for people to go and be part of it. Does our community even make $35,000 a year? No. Many of us don't even make that. So Obama, you need to come out here and talk to the community. And it's not just the communities of those pr protesters that you saw. A new report shows that city budgets are getting crushed, forcing them to cut more workers and services. And at the same time, corporate chiefs are saying that China is more business friendly than the U.S. Peter Schiff is here to tell me how all of this is possible. Hi, Peter. Thanks for being on the show. So, Hi. For, thanks for having me up. My first question to you. During these tough economic times, Obama's approval ratings are 42 percent. Who is shelling out 36 grand for an Obama fundraiser and why? Well, who are the 42 percent that are still approving of <laughs> President Obama? I mean, these guys have got to wake up and see the reality. Well, as far as my other question, who's shelling out all that dough towards his campaign? Well, look, there are obviously some people uh, that are able to make money off of this system. Unfortunately, uh, not nearly enough. Uh, that's, that's the problem. And there are, you know, there are people with money in the country who, uh, you know, don't understand what's going on. And so uh, they believe uh, uh, that Obama is actually going to help the country. And there are other people that know that he's not, but they're, they have a vested interest in the programs that he's perpetuating. Many of those programs are responsible for impoverishing uh, the majority of Americans, but uh, they enrich uh, his uh, contributors. Like what? Give me one example that you think is the best example of what you're saying. Well, I think there's a lot of policies that are perpetuating the financial bubble, that are perpetuating uh, Wall Street, and so I think a lot of financiers are benefiting from the reckless policies. Certainly, a lot of the industries that government drives money towards, education, health care, those, uh, those sectors are bloated. Uh, and there's a lot of money that's being spent there in a very wasteful manner, but obviously there are people who benefit from that wasteful spending because that, that's the source of, of their income. So there is an entire constituency that is feeding off the public trough, and uh, you know Barack Obama is there uh, to fill it up. And so there are plenty of people that benefit from it, and they help uh, reelect them. And of course, you know you've got uh, you know my, the drug companies, I think, pharmaceutical companies benefit. Um, large brokerage firms uh, benefit. There are a number of companies that I think are direct beneficiaries of a lot of these government programs. A lot of regulations that stifle competition uh, benefit uh, the companies that are being protected uh, by competition. But I think um, the, the entire economy suffers from these big government policies. So, you know, you've run for office. Do you think that this is why Obama's campaign election efforts have not been as impacted by the economy as one would believe? Exactly what you're talking about? No, I mean, I think they are impacted. I think a lot of people are becoming disillusioned uh, with the president. That's why his support is, uh, is, is falling. And I expect his support to continue to fall. But that's not going to diminish his ability to raise money. He's still going to raise money from the people who profit uh, from the status quo, even if the status quo is undermining the, the strength of the U.S. economy. And, of course, you know, as the government is able to help ruin the economy and create dependency, people who become dependent on government checks are now more likely to vote for the people who are signing those checks. They don't connect the dots. Uh, they don't understand that the government is responsible for their plight but they buy into the rhetoric that the government will solve the problems, which is why you know, the government wants to perpetuate poverty, uh, because it's easy to get the votes of the impoverished when you're the one that is uh, providing them with funds. Speaking of poverty, Peter, city finances are just getting totally crushed by the economic downturn. And just a new report that came out from the National League of Cities today says that cities ended their 2010 fiscal year with the largest 
year-over-year -year reductions in revenues and spending in the history of the survey. Why are cities getting creamed now? Why aren't they what? Why are they getting creamed now? Why are, they getting, why are their finances getting so crushed right now? Well, the whole country is getting crushed. I mean, the cities aren't going to be immune from that. Remember, the cities are drawing their revenues from their tax base, mm -hmm. and their tax base is being eroded. Property values are falling. People aren't paying property taxes. Incomes are diminished. Uh, you're getting less sales tax revenue. Uh, there's all sorts of uh, uh, ways that cities and states are going to get squeezed from this recession. The real problem is going to be when interest rates start to rise, because a lot of of these municipalities or states are surviving uh, by borrowing. Mm -hmm. And when the cost of borrowing goes up, it hasn't happened yet, but eventually it is going to happen. And then you're going to have a double whammy because it's going to cost the cities a lot more to borrow money, but they're also going to have to borrow a lot more because higher interest rates are also going to, at least in the short run, further undermine this consumer debt based uh, bubble economy that we're living in. So, I mean, right now, the impact of, of the economy on the cities means that they're continuing to cut personnel, they can't invest in infrastructure, they're cutting services. So are you saying that this is just going to get worse if, if, if interest rates go up? Yeah, it is going to get worse. Uh, I mean, interest rates need to go up, but not for the reason that they're going to go up. The real reason they're going to go up now is because inflation drives them up, because the government is destroying our money and our savings. I mean, it would be better if we could have higher real interest rates uh, where the Fed gets ahead of the curve and we can have more savings and investment. But still, that is going to pressure the debtors. And to the extent that uh, governments have too much debt, higher interest rates are going to be problematic. That is why the cure is going to be so painful for certain segments of, uh, of the economy. But ultimately, if we can cure the economy, we can have much more robust economic growth, which ultimately will benefit uh, the, the states even if in the short run they are negatively impacted by the increased cost of servicing their debts, which is also why some of these missed valleys or states are going to end up defaulting on some of that debt in order for it to be manageable. I mean, it, it just doesn't seem like if ever how much worse could it get? It's already so bad. I mean, no, what no, you're no, calling it, for. It, it, could get a lot, it could get a lot worse. I mean, we really see nothing yet. I mean, yeah, I mean, things are bad. People are having a hard time uh, getting jobs. Uh, but the people that still have jobs, I mean, yeah, they're getting squeezed uh, a little bit, but nothing like it's going to be. Uh, no, I think it's going to get a lot worse when you really see a precipitous decline in the value of the dollar. That's really going to kick it in because that's going to lead to big, big increases in consumer prices on basic necessities, which are really uh, going to crush American families. And when you see a big increase in interest rates, I mean, this, this is going to get much, much worse. I mean, this, we're really still in the calm before the storm. But when do you think that storm will hit? Because we've seen so much international turmoil with, for example, what's going on in Europe, that the dollar, people have ran to the dollar in recent times. Yeah, I mean, that's what's buying us some extra time. Uh, because people are more worried about Europe right now than America, and so our day of reckoning is being postponed as a result of that. But ultimately, by allowing the U.S. economy to go deeper into debt, uh, it means our day of reckoning is going to be that much uh, more dramatic when it comes. And, you know, I think that one of the catalysts could be some sort of resolution to the European situation where the world can breathe a sigh of relief and, and, and decide that, okay, the worst is behind Europe and things are going to improve because then they're going to focus their attention back on the U.S. because we've done nothing to improve our situation. Our fiscal imbalances continue to deteriorate. So what's better for Europe could be worse for the U.S. Speaking of worse for the U.S., uh, while well, the public sector is hemorrhaging employees with these cities and states being really impacted by the economy, the private sector isn't exactly picking up the slack. And we just heard the CEO of Coke saying that the U.S. is less business friendly than China because of the U.S. political gridlock and the tax structure, which he says is antiquated. Peter, is it easier to do business in China than the U.S.? Well, I've been saying that for years. That's why we're investing more money over there than we are in the U.S. Uh, you know, I, you know, I often joke that you know, if the government would simply uh, get out of the way and give capitalism a chance, that I know it'll work because you know it's working pretty good in communist China. So I think it would work in America if we gave it a try. And you know, so we want, we need to get rid of a lot of these government sector jobs. I mean, that that's part of the solution. The government jobs are a drain on the economy. We can't afford them. So a lot of government employees need to lose their jobs, but we want them to get productive jobs in the private sector. The reason they're not 
is because the government has erected so many barriers uh, to employment. The government has made it so much more difficult for businesses to grow and expand and hire people. I mean, the regulations, many of the regulations that have been written specifically punish employers who hire. There are all sorts of taxes and, and, and fees that are directly tied to hiring people. And probably as far as litigation, you have all sorts of litigation risks when you hire somebody. It is very easy to sue your employer. If you get fired, it's very easy to sue. And so uh, businesses want to mitigate uh, the cost of litigation. And the way they do that is limit the number of people they hire. So it's kind of a catch-22 because people are getting laid off, but there's not jobs for them. But you say that businesses uh, don't have the necessary, uh, you know, way to get through regulations in order to hire more people. And tax holidays that the government is talking about yeah. have been shown to not actually create jobs. But we're going to have to leave the discussion there for now. No, but, but that was Peter Schiff, President. I'm sorry, Peter, we're totally out of time. That's President of Euro-Pacific Capital. Thanks for being on the show.